Dank je. Goedemorgen, dames en heren. Ik open hierbij deze academische zitting waarin Hansje Smelen het academisch proefschrift getiteld Sensational Breast Reconstruction in het openbaar zal verdedigen. Uh, de oppositie en de, ook de presentatie zal in het Engels zijn, dus we switchen nu van taal. En ik uh, nodig de kandidaat, mevrouw Smelen, uit om uh, een kort overzicht te geven van de resultaten en de belangrijkste conclusies. Ga uit de gang. Dank u wel. Thank you. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Assessment Committee and Supervisors, dear friends and family, thank you all for being here today. In the next few minutes, I'm going to try to give you an overview of what it is I'm trying to say inside the pages of my PhD thesis, Sensational Rest Reconstruction. The first time that I was confronted with the problem that we're going to be talking about today, I was studying medicine and I was interested in care for breast cancer patients. And I interviewed women who had a breast conserving operation. And at the time, I interviewed one woman, a, a woman who told me something that really opened my eyes and has stayed with me ever since. This woman had asymmetric breasts after her surgery, and she did not have, want to have another operation to have a symmetric end result. And she explained to me, my operated breast is not like it used to be anymore. It has become, well, it has become just very numb, actually. And of course, I'm afraid that if I will have the other breast operate, uh, operated, I will have the same problem again. Um, so for this woman, the numbness she experienced in her operated breast was actually more of a concern than the aesthetic end result of her operation. And this is going to be the broad area that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to continue by giving you a bit of an overview of the bigger problem that we're talking about. Um, because every year, hundreds of thousands of women have one or both breasts removed for the treatment of breast cancer or the prevention of breast cancer. And um, probably everyone in the room knows someone who has been through breast cancer. And some, some of us in the room have had breast cancer ourselves or have an elevated risk of developing this disease. And although breast cancer kills lots of women each year, nine out of 10 who are diagnosed early will survive. As doctors, it is not only our mission to um, cure and pre uh, prevent breast cancer, but also to allow for the best possible quality of life after treatment. What this practically comes down to is that we try to minimize and remedy side effects of necessary treatments such as radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and as we're going to mostly discuss today, surgery. And this is because we want patients to continue to live life to its fullest and to feel good in their bodies after treatment um, because we want them to thrive rather than just survive. So reconstruction is one of the concrete things that we can offer women to help them move through the trauma of breast loss. Now, I think it's really important to stress that this is a very individual choice and that not every patient will want to have a reconstruction. But for some, losing a breast is a profound loss and it can be a break in the clouds for patients to have the shape of the breast restored. And, and what we can do for patients these days looks pretty fabulous. The woman in this photo had a double breast amputation or a mastectomy. And my um, PhD supervisor, Dr. Dyander, who is sitting to my left today, um, reconstructed these breasts using the a tissue flap from the patient's own belly, transplanted to the chest area along with its blood supply to reincarnate here as a breast. This is a challenging operation that takes several hours, but it gives the patient a lifelong soft and natural appearing breast shape. Um, like I said, I think it's really great that we can do this for patients, But when we ask them how they perceive their reconstruction, we realize that there can be hidden morbidity even if the visual result of the operation looks pretty good. So once again, like in the introduction, patients who had a breast reconstruction complain that their new, new breast feels alien to them and that the loss of sensation affects their sexual well-being and their daily functioning. 
And thanks to these patient voices, we are more and more aware that we also need to pay attention to aspects of the reconstruction beyond what we can see. In my thesis, we aim to contribute towards sensational breast reconstruction, which is a reconstruction that restores outward, outward appearance and also normal sensations, so that, so that the reconstruction doesn't only look good, but feels good to women. We studied several questions about breast uh, sensation in health and after surgery that will hopefully get us a little bit closer towards reaching this ideal. And four of these questions are listed here. The first question we asked is which nerves are most important to spare during breast operations like partial mastectomy, where the tumor is removed and the healthy breast tissue is left in place. To find out more, we summarized data from 19 anatomical studies. We already knew that the breast is innervated by so-called intercostal nerves that run underneath our ribs. These intercostal nerves have, each have a branch that travels through the outer part of the breast tissue. And another branch that travels through the inner part of the breast tissue. And these things so far we already knew. But we did not quite know which nerves contribute most. We put the evidence from the anatomical studies together and we found that the outer branches of the fourth and the fifth intercostal nerve and the inner branch of the fourth intercostal nerve are probably the most important to spare during operations um, because they were the most consistent source of innervation across the studies or they co covered the largest surface area or they were the uh, main nerve to the nipple. So this study is mainly relevant for improving sensory outcomes for patients who have a partial mastectomy. But unfortunately, in quite a few cases, we still have to do a full mastectomy where we um, remove the whole breast, including the nerves that run through it. And what we end up in these situations uh, with um, are these nerve stumps, which are really loose ends. Um, and if the patient chooses to have a reconstruction using a tissue flap from elsewhere on the body, there will probably be very little or no sensation in this new breast. To address this problem, it is possible to connect a sensory nerve from the reconstruction flap to an intercostal nerve in the chest area. Dr. Aldona Spiegel, who is here with us today, was not the very first to use this technique, but she was the uh, person who proposed to connect a nerve from the flap to the inner branch of the third intercostal nerve. And this is the exact technique that we're using um, here in Maastricht, and we started that about a de decade ago. There is growing evidence that doing this nerve repair uh, permits better sensory return in the breast. But it's unknown whether there is a surgical learning curve for this technique. In other, uh, in other words, whether this technique needs a lot of practice to be mastered and whether surgeons, um, how hard it is for surgeons who are already doing this operation to add nerve repair. We studied four surgeons and we looked at whether they more often successfully performed nerve repair in, with increasing experience. Here's a graph show, showing um, nerve repair rates from one surgeon over time. And I'm not gonna go into the details here too much, um, but you see a lot of variation in successful no nerve co-optation attempts that don't really follow a particular pattern. And for none of the surgeons did we really find a clear learning curve where the number of successful nerve repairs increased over time. But we did see that when a surgeon really believed in this technique and um, was really committed towards, to making this work, success rates of almost 80% could be reached. Reasons why nerve repair failed were, among others, inability to find a suitable nerve in the reconstruction flap, for example, due to prior operations, um, which led to scarring. Um, another reason was that, for example, there could not be, um, there was no uh, suitable nerve to be found in the chest area, mostly because of prior radiotherapy, which also leads to scarring and then it's hard to find a nerve. And sometimes the nerve ends were just too short to be connected. So this finding has important implications for patient counseling because they have to know that even if, we're try, uh, if we try our best, there's always a slim chance that we're just 
unable to do this nerve repair. Even in the best cases where we manage to do a nerve repair, most patients will never regain full sensation after breast reconstruction. And one clinical observation that might have to do with this is that breast reconstruction flaps seem to burn easily when exposed to heat. But how exactly this works is still poorly understood. So the next question we asked is, why do reconstructed breasts burn so easily? This is a photo of a patient who had a breast reconstruction using a tissue flap from her own belly 15 years before. And she laid in the sun wearing a black bikini and she developed this full thickness burn. What intrigued us is how this can happen because supposedly this breast reconstruction didn't have enough sensation to warn the patient that the flap was burning. Um, but her other breast didn't burn with the same sun exposure. To find out more, we needed help from experts in the field of skin physi physiology, and we found them at the University of Lyon in France. And together, we studied whether the skin of breast reconstruction flaps is able to get rid of heat effectively. So in healthy skin, the blood vessels widen when exposed, into, uh, when exposed to heat to eliminate that heat. And this is a protective mechanism that is in part mediated by sensory nerves. To study whether this mechanism is intact in breast reconstruction flaps, we use an electrode to gently stimulate the breast surface. And we learned that the reaction that is supposed to protect the skin from heat injury was significantly weaker in these re reconstruction flaps compared to healthy breasts. And whilst reconstruction, uh, re reconstructed breasts with a nerve repair are better in terms of conscious sensation, this nerve repair doesn't really seem to make a whole lot of difference for the ability to eliminate heat. So this was fun one of the first studies done in this field and more research is needed to find out more and um, verify our, our results. Right now, the best thing that we can do is counsel patients that they should keep their reconstructed breasts away from heat sources so as not to burn them. So we've talked about the anatomy of sensory nerves, about nerve repair in breast reconstruction, and how nerve repair does not really seem to uh, fix the problem of heat, vulnerability to heat yet. When we try to restore better sensation in a re reconstructed breast, there is only one way of knowing whether our efforts benefit patients, which is to ask the patient directly. And this sounds straightforward, but actually measuring outcomes from the patient perspective is quite difficult um, to do that in a standardized and thorough way. Um, we suspected that the data collected around this subject in prior st studies would be quite poor because there were no good questionnaires um, out there. To prove this, we searched the literature for questionnaires that have been used to evaluate sensory outcomes of breast surgery from the patient perspective. We found 124 questionnaires, 120 of which had been formally tested and four of which um, uh, sorry, 120 of which had not been formally tested and four had been tested, but they um, were questionnaires that focused on what way broader as, um, outcomes, such as sensory disturbances and discomfort, so that the few questions pertaining to sensation in those skills were completely overruled by all the other aspects that were being measured. Um, so the problem with these questionnaires is that we cannot be sure that they indeed reliably measure what we're intending to measure, and so we shouldn't use these questionnaires anymore. Um, very recently, two high-quality questionnaires have become available, and this is great news for breast sensation research, um, because it can really improve the quality of future work in this area, and it can tell us which of our therapies add value for patients and which ones don't. So we are on a journey where we want to improve sensory outcomes for patients who have a breast reconstruction, and we're never losing sight of the ideal, um, the sensational breast that we're working towards. And to make this happen, there are several things to consider, and in my thesis, we addressed a handful of them. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to hearing the questions from the esteemed and highly esteemed opponents. <laughs> thank you.
Thanks a lot for this uh, clear overview of your work. Um, your supervisory team has collected a team of uh, specialists that uh, assessed your thesis already, and they were very positive about it. But of course, questions remain, and uh, that's why we have a 45-minute opposition now, which will be started by Professor Faber. Professor Faber is uh, a professor of neuromuscular disorders at the uh, Maastricht University Medical Center. And she was the chair of your assessment committee and is now secretary of this committee. Please. Thank you. Dear candidate, first I would like to congratulate you with the important work that resulted in this thesis. And of course, I would also like to congratulate your supervising team. Um, my first question concerns chapter two, where you describe cultural differences between this, the different countries. And I was a bit intrigued about these cultural differences. And let me explain why this really struck me. We have performed research on uh, patient reported outcome measures. And what we did is um, develop questionnaires about participation and social activities in patients. Mm -hmm. And what you then can do, if you use a special method, use speci specific statistics, you can see whether patients with the same capacity or the same degree of involvement of the disease, um, and you can compare them, um, the certain items in this questionnaire and see whether there are differences in, in countries, for example. And here you can see that patients who are uh, equally affected by a disease, if they come from Spain and they come from Italy, that the patients from Italy find it far more difficult to dance, for example. So Spanish people are better dancers. And you can also compare, for example, between sexes. So it turns out that for males, vacuum cleaning is far more difficult than for women. Of course, you say, well, we knew that, but that's really the case. So that's why I wondered, you now really focused on what do patients want, so what is their preferences, but could there be, what are the really reasons behind these cultural differences? Do you know? Highly esteemed opponents, thank you for the question. Um, no, I don't think we do, um, because unfortunately, so I think it's really interested, interesting what we found in this study, we saw big cultural or big differences in the way these patients answered the questionnaires. And it's a bit of a pity because as a researcher, you're always very, very excited when you see something. You're like, yes, I found something. You don't want everything to be the same because then what, what are you going to write about it? So I was really happy to see those differences. Um, but it's a bit unfortunate. We, we used a questionnaire that we made ourselves just to have a bit of a first um, try at catching some of these differences. And the interesting thing is that we saw these big differences, but then we started um, comparing them to the literature and also to uh, cultural differences in the way people tend to answer questions in a questionnaire. And that also seems to be very um, dependent on culture. And these patterns that we saw corresponded exactly to what they described in literature. So we found differences, but we don't actually know whether these differences are actual differences in attitudes towards breast reconstruction and, and wishes from patients and, and, and what they would like to gain from it, or whether that is just purely the different behavior of answering the questions, whereas actually they're all like, their, their desires are all a little bit the same. Um, so no, we don't know what, what the sources are of the cultural differences, and even worse, we don't even know what we measured. And how should we further investigate this? Because it's a, it's a really important topic, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think we would need help from the social sciences um, to really, so the title of this study is also Breast Reconstruction Put in con into Context, and I think that's really important because breast reconstruction is a social cultural phenomenon. Um, so yeah, I think we really need to put it into con the broader context more and see what is really underneath it. And social sciences would would be would be our partners in crime, I think, to um, learn more more about this. So I would definitely in a, in the next study I would 
take more countries and dig deeper and try to really understand what is what is underneath it. Maybe quali qualitative work would would be good. Focus Maybe. groups or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I think that would be better. I have a, a, a quick question about chapter three, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the other opponents will go in further into that. That's about the learning curve you described. Yeah. Um, I found it a little bit contraintuitive. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? What exactly did you find? Um, well, that you don't see a real learning curve. I would expect to see a learning curve if you do an operation uh, more frequently or for a longer period, mm -hmm. that you get better and better. I mean, yeah. that's usually what we see if we do things, and that's what every assumption about numbers needed to do an operation, for example, uh, are based on. Yeah. Do you have an idea how to explain this? I think I do. I can't prove it because we we can't prove it using this study. But I, my my, I would argue that deep flat breast, breast reconstructions are long operations that take at least four hours and sometimes more, sometimes eight, sometimes ten. And in an operation of so many hours, you have so many var variables, and it's also quite variable sometimes. So I'm not an expert, but I know that some operations go very smoothly, and others are quite a challenge. And what we saw in this study is that when the operation was particularly hard, which we could see when, for example, there were interoperative um, complications and they had to do redo the anastomosis, like sometimes up to seven times, imagine that, is, that is, really takes a toll on the surgeon, then sometimes the nerve just wasn't a priority anymore. So I think there were far more variables involved and nerve cooptation is this tiny little bit of the operation. There are so many other things that need to be done. So um, I think it was far more dependent on the difficulty of the individual operation than um, yeah, expecting to do a little bit better every single operation that you do. So okay. that, is, that is what I think. <laughs> Thank you for your answer and I will give the word back to the prorector. Thank you, uh, Professor Faber. Um, tonight I will tell my partner that a, a professor told me that women are better at vacuum, <laughs> vacuum cleaning. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, the opposition uh, will be continued by Professor Spiegel. Professor Spiegel is a Professor of Surgical Innovation and Technology and also a Professor of Plastic Surgery at the Houston Methodist Hospital. And thanks again for joining this opposition. Please, go ahead. Dear candidate, um, thank you. Um, your work has really been a very much an add to the foundational knowledge that we have for breast sensation, which is also very close to my heart. So um, the work you have done in, in your um, co-promoter um, has been really um, a way to make sure that we include sensation in our breast reconstruction goal, which strangely hasn't been uh, something that's been widely accepted. As it relates to the sensation and uh, restoration of sensation long-term, we know that long-term patient sensation improves. And this is quite interesting because it is longer, it keeps on improving even though the time for the axon regeneration has passed. What do you think you would hypothesize as the mechanism for this improvement of sensation with time? Yeah. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for this question. And it's an honor to have you here. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, first, I would like to tell you that I, um, I recognize what you tell me because in my study um, about vasodilation, I think it's chapter... Um, five. Um, we also did a sensory evaluation to see what the mechanical and temperature detection thresh thresholds were. And there we were very lucky because we had patients with a really long follow-up time, I think up to six years or so. And it was really incredible because some of them with, with a nerve just had such good sensation and I just didn't know, I, I, was, I was testing it and it was under my hands and uh, yeah, I just couldn't deny it anymore. I also, since then, it really, yeah, I really believe in this technique. But so why there continues to be um, sensory re regeneration long after the accents uh, should already have been fully regenerated is 
I can't explain it, but I think there will be other ways the nerves find each other. Um, so not only through the co-opted nerve, but also maybe via the wound beds, somehow they must be connected. Um, I, think, I think the only possible explanation that I can come up with now is that somehow those nerves keep on, keep on finding each other and, and um, growing towards each other and their growth fa factors and all kinds of interesting biological mechanisms must be working hard that we have no clue about, or at least I don't. But um, yeah, it's an interesting observation that I also share. Great, thank you. Um, as it relates to chapter three, the breast anatomy uh, and the sensation, it is really important for us to really understand the details of that because I think it does make a difference in the mastectomy techniques as well as uh, restoration of sensation. When you have certain nerves that you connect, for example, let's say you connect the fourth lateral intercostal for improved nipple sensation, then you describe the neurosomes for each nerve. What happens long-term to those neurosomes if the other nerves aren't connected? Does the neurosome change the area? Dr. Tander is currently um, studying this. Um, I don't know how that's going and whether we already have an answer to this, but um, so what happens? We have um, mostly uh, alpha, beta, um, fibers that project to our somat somatosensory cortex. And we know that this somatosensory cortex is plastic. It is a representation of our body surface scheme and it re represents the areas where we can feel, but is plastic and it depends on what well, we can have an injury, we can have trauma, or we can, have, we can start using a specific body part more and then a certain region expands and, and we know that the regions can take take over each other if, if we have a trauma and then suddenly uh, yeah other parts of the brain start um, start being responsible or start representing this 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 loss area um, what happens when we only connect the outer branch of the fourth intercostal nerve that goes to the nipple and we don't connect the other branches, I would hope that the brain does its work and that uh, other regions will take over, so that the other intercostal nerves. Um, but yeah, I didn't do any studies where, where I could prove that, but it's definitely an, a, a found, founded hypothesis that needs testing. Um, what is interesting though is that this wasn't part of my research, but I stumbled upon a whole lot of inter uh, literature that I found um, really interesting, and that was more about C fibers. And C fibers are are different kinds of nerve fibers. They're a little bit more um, prehistoric, so to say, in a in a in a certain way. And they also don't pre project to our somatosensory cortex. They they project to the limbic system, and they are not plastic. So, and I think that these C fibers could be particularly important when we're talking about breasts and what happens to those. I've absolutely no absolutely no clue about, and I would be really interested to, to, yeah, to learn more about that. Thank you. Um, in chapter five, the thermoregulation of the flap, it's a very interesting concept. Um, and surprisingly, you didn't see much of a difference. Can you explain why, and would it be a different way that you would study this in the future to perhaps notice smaller differences a little bit better? Um, yes, um, we, we did this study because we hoped to see, to be honest, we just hoped to see a difference between the flaps that were re-innervated and the flaps that were not, were not because the reaction is in part mediated by the sensory nerves. We saw that those flaps we're better in terms of conscious sensation, so we hope that the unconscious mechanism, the vis like the, the stuff that we don't have any control over, that happen also when we don't think about it, that that would also be better. And we didn't, we couldn't find such a result. Now it is true that there was a lot of confounding in this study. Uh, the measurements that we did are really sensitive, and there are tons of factors involved that will change the reaction a lot. One of the things that we found was chemotherapy that has, had a really strong influence on the ability to, to widen the blood vessels, um, and there, was more, there were more patients who had chemotherapy in the group with the nerve, so that was 
not very helpful to start with. Then we did um, normalization to baseline because you also have a baseline um, level of blood flow that you need to take into account um, and that in, in most studies that use this technique um, is accounted for. But when we did that, um, it distorted our results because somehow the baseline uh, blood flow in the group with nerve cooptation was, I think, higher, so that the reaction seemed um, much worse, and that sort of distorted reality. We thought we thought so. We decided not to um, correct for this, but that's actually not um, not good. So I would definitely, in the next study, I would definitely try to take a yeah um, find a find a larger sample size. And I would um, I would somehow try to correct for the for the confounding variables, and it would also be really helpful if we so for example we we did some histology to to see if we can could find the C fibers in the skin. Um, um, we did that in one patient, and it would be really good if we did that with a few more specimen because NS one is not really like it's not really telling us anything. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my final question is about really the way we judge any breast reconstruction is really what the patients think. It's the patient outcomes. And we have a challenge understanding patient outcomes as it relates to breast sensation. Um, partly because, as you mentioned also, some women have a difference in the way they perceive sensation. Sometimes they feel it's important, sometimes they feel it is not. Again, if you were to design a study going forward, having learned everything that you have already about measuring patient outcomes, what are the things you would um, like to put in the study as the study design to improve what we understand about patient outcomes? Um. So I think what you're basically saying is that patients have different needs. Not all of them are interested in sensation. And I think we could um, try to individual, individualize care more uh, when we know which patients um, would really benefit from, from the highest degree of sensation that we can, we, we can realize for them. And I think patient reported outcome measures, despite their name, are not only useful to measure outcomes, but also to, um, to triage them before the operation, to see what is really important to them. And it's really nice because, so these patient reported outcome measures specifically about sensation are really helpful, and you can also definitely give them to the patients before their operations to see what, what, their, what their baseline breast sensation level is. But they're are also really interesting questionnaires out there that, for example, measure embodiment of breasts. You could also use them before the operation to see whether that is a really important part of the woman's body scheme. Um, I think that is that could be interesting to do. And what is also really nice is that in effective touch research, which is just more about the social components, the effective components of touch, they're also really important, uh, really interesting questionnaires which ask a little bit how much need a woman has for social contact and physical contact and there are really nice questions here in there for example do you do you use cream after having a sh having taken a shower do you have take pleasure into caring for your body and i think these are really important and interesting things to know about these women because then you know a little bit about how important touch even is is for them in general not not specifically for the breast but just in general how much they long for um, physical contact with others. So I think we could use, also use those questionnaires to triage a little bit to know what, what type of patient we ha have before us. And of course, in the outpatient clinic, we can just have a conversation with them. We don't need questionnaires for that, but in a research setting, we do. We need those standardized ways. And there's, there's loads of cool um, instruments out there. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Spiegel. The opposition will be continued by Professor Hamdi. He is present online. Uh, professor Hamdi is uh, Professor and Chairman of Plastic and Recon uh, Reconstructive Surgery at the Brussels University Hospital. Professor Hamdi, go ahead.
I will ask the uh, technical service to uh, see if they can help. Uh, uh, but then for now, we will continue with the next opponent and we will try to get you in, Professor Hamdi. Um, the next opponent... to you, your supervising research team, your friends, family, and partner. I would like to ask you some questions regarding chapter two as well, um, uh, which is a chapter regarding the breast reconstruction patterns. And uh, what you state in the method section of this chapter is that no sample size was calculated as the study was not hypothesis driven. So my question is, can you explain to me what your expectations were before you started this cross-sectional study? Um, yeah, it was... Um, so we dived into the literature... Dove, dived. Into the literature before. <laughs> and um, um, we saw that we couldn't find any studies that mm, compared breast reconstruction patterns across European countries. We only found similar studies um, done between US states, and there they found a lot of variation, which mainly had to do with reimbursement, um, because that's very different between different states. Uh, so that for Europe, there were not really specific um, hints to build on. Um, so they didn't really provide us with any very specific hypotheses. Um, I think this was more meant as an or, yeah, orienting hypothesis generating study to see whether uh, we could catch some kind of differences. Um, and that's also why we try to measure so many aspects in a quite, quite a small study, which is not exactly to be called a strength, of course. Um, but yeah, we just didn't really know what, what we would find. Uh, we know that breast reconstruction is very multifactorial, what, what the choice is going to be eventually, because the patient's opinion is really important, but to be fair, it's also really important what the standard is in that specific hospital, uh, maybe, maybe even more so. So to be honest with you, we didn't have very specific hypotheses, we just wanted to look at what we could find, and then um, this is also, to be honest, more a study that satisfies the, the curiosity of, of colleagues in different hospitals more than that. It's a very strong methodological study that really, that you can um, draw super useful conclusions for, for, for everyday pra practice because it's just not very generalizable. But I do think that the study um, highlights that this is a really interesting field to, to uh, explore more because, like I said, it's a social phenomenon and it's not very often um, studied from this perspective. And I, I, I do think that that would add, um, yeah, that would add a lot. Okay, thank you. Uh, then another question. In the, in the results section of this chapter, you report that patients from Uppsala were more frequently had a delayed deep reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, I was a little bit surprised to see that most patients from this hospital presented to the plastic surgeon at first after their mastectomy, excluding the possibility to carry out a direct reconstruction. And in addition, if you look at table one, you can see that the frequency of prior radiotherapy is very different between the three hospitals. And from these results, I get the impression that the treatment patterns described are influenced by the timing of the first consultation to the plastic surgeon mm -hmm. and the frequency of prior radiotherapy, because that ex ex excludes uh, 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 immediate uh, reconstruction, I think. So can you explain to me uh, how the design of a future study should, uh, should be to explore whether patients from different countries choose differently if they are asked at the same time point in breast cancer diagnosis? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And I think in a, in a next study, we would definitely have to broaden the scope because now we only looked at the reconstructive service. And of course, it doesn't start there. It starts with 
the breast cancer diagnosis. It starts with the consultation with the oncologic surgeon. Um, and there are, it's a multidisciplinary thing and reconstruction is, is one of the things that comes later. Um, but it should be talked about from the very beginning. And I think it's really important that if we're going to study this deeper and, and going to do a, a, a bit of a better study that we don't do this on a reconstructive surgery level, but do this on a breast clinic level where we include other factors that just reflect the whole process that the patients go through. Because I think it's really important that you stress these patients were only sent to the plastic surgeon after their, their mastectomy was already done, which precluded one of, one of the options. They just could never choose that anymore. The, the immediate reconstruction was just not an option anymore. So, and I think to describe that in more detail and also to highlight, because that could be an implication from this, from this study, health equity is an important theme. And, and um, by comparing your standard uh, care to those of other countries, it's not said that it's going to be better in other countries, but by seeing the differences, you might be able to see, okay, this is where we can grow, this is where we can improve, and this is actually where we're doing much better, much better than the rest. So yeah, I think my answer to your question would be, I would do it on a breast um, clinic, breast service level, and not only on the plastic surgery level. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you, Dr. De Boer. Um, I see that Professor Hamdi is back again. Can you hear us, Professor Hamdi? I hear you perfectly. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, great. Please. So the opposition will now be continued by you, Professor Hamdi. Uh, again, That's you're so. a professor and chairman of plastic and reconstructive surgery at the Brussels University Hospital. Great to have you. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Um, um, dear, uh, dear candidate, and congratulations for your uh, promoter and co-promoter. Now, your, your work is very interesting, actually, uh, not only for the content, but I never expected Julia Roberts to be quoted in the research about the breast reconstruction. And uh, the word sensational, can you tell me, please, what's the difference between sensation, sensitivity, sensibility, and sensibility? <laughs> Highly esteemed opponents, can you please repeat which words you want me to um, explain? The difference between sensation, sensitivity, sensibility, and sensibility. <laughs> okay, um, I, I will start by sensation. That was one of the words, right? Sensation. Sensation in, is all the aspects of sensation that, yeah, that define feeling. So that includes the ability to feel touch, to feel pain, to feel heat and cold and itch. And it also includes more psychological, more woolly um, concepts such as embodiment, the degree to which this body part belongs to my body or or whether it is a separate entity that doesn't really belong to me it's not part of me um, I think that would be my definition of sensation so it is really encomp encompassing all the aspects um, sensitivity is um, a little bit of a more narrow word um, because it means the degree of, yeah, how, how sensitive, how, how able the skin is and you as an organism are to, um, to consciously perceive a stimulus. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's a measure, actually. You can have a lot of sensitivity and you can have no sensitivity. It's, it's a quantitative thing, a little bit. And then sensibility. <laughs> so when I started my PhD and I started to write about this theme, I had to choose between those words because in the literature, some people said sensibility and others said sensitivity. And I didn't know which was the right one because English is not my native language. And then I think I chose 
from the definitions of the Oxford Dictionary, and I think sensibility was um, was also meant other things. <laughs> it wasn't very specific to to to, to sensation, but but sensibility also, um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember, but I knew that it wasn't the right word that I was looking for. It is something different. And then what, what was the first, what, the fourth one, sorry? Sensibility. Sensibility. I, I, yeah, I explained. I, I, I don't know, unfortunately. Sen sen sensibility. Sensible. Sensibility. Well, okay. So sensible, that has more to do with uh, whether, whether it's a sensible idea to... Um, open a bottle of champagne after the PhD thesis of it. So that's more about like, um, if it is it smart, is it a good idea? Um, sensible has something to, has to do with, um, yeah, smart, smart idea. Of, no, no, no. No, never mind. We, we go further, we go further. Second question, um, in, in the chapter about the anatomy, you end up presenting like a schema about the territory of innervation of its intercostal nerve. And in your schema, and the, based on many anatomic studies, we see that the biggest territory on the breast is coming from the D branch of intercostal um, nerve. This is why you led many people, including myself, in 1997, I did the first three cases in, in Glasgow. Philip Londale did a lot of research about that, and we used the lateral branch. Now, why big change with uh, Dr. Spiegel approach? Why now uh, we, we talk more and more about this approach? What is the reason you know, people shift to using the anterior branch of the fourth intercostal nerve? Um, thank you for your question. Um, so indeed, from the anatomical study that we did, we found that the lateral branch of the fourth intercostal nerve is the most consistent nerve to the nipple. But we also found that this is not the only nerve to the nipple. The nipple is innervated by multiple nerves. Um, and you're asking why we more and more choose the anterior approach where we where we go where we do the nerve coaptation from the medial aspect of the breast when in fact we see in these studies that the lateral cutaneous branch of the fourth intercostal nerve is is the main nerve to the nipple and covers the largest surface any area um, so what is a really big advantage as I read from the medial approach is that you're in the same field where you where you dissected the, um, the the vessels that you're going to use. So you don't have to do any, uh, yeah, you don't have to do much additional dissection. So that makes it quite convenient as I understand it. Um, and as far as I know, that is the main reason that we, so that makes it very, that makes it very, Easy, that makes it relatively easy to implement this technique when you don't have to do tons of other actions to make it happen. Whereas in the lateral aspect of the breast, you're not really, you have to take other actions. And I think that, yeah, um, the, the technique was really popularized so it's, by... It's, technic it's a technical issue then. And this make me go to the my uh, third question, which uh, the study you know, comparing the outcome and the learning curve as was alluded by the other uh, opponent. Uh, and we see the average operative time, it doesn't make any difference, it's only one minute, which of course, uh, as I believe this is illusion. Um, it's not easy sometimes to find the nerves. And I think you, you should show what is the average of uh, timing, you know, invest in the surgery to find nerve and especially in those failed procedure. And um, I think you didn't uh, mention that in your research. And I didn't see any differences between the gender of the uh, uh, surgeons, if there was any difference between female plastic surgeon or male plastic surgeon in the outcome, um, um, other, uh, some of them, or, or I suspect the female maybe are able to do or to find more the nerve because they are more um, you know, looking forward to do this procedure. Can you uh, comment on that? Yes, thank you for this question. Um, 
I think I was a little bit too shy to include it because you're talking about the learning curve project here, right? Yeah. Yes. I was a little bit too shy to um, disclose the genders of those four surgeons that we were studying because there were only four of them, but there were two women and two, two male surgeons. And it was true that the highest nerve repair rates were definitely among the female surgeons. And I do really think that is... I mean, we only studied four surgeons, but I, I, can't, I, I can't believe that is a coincidence. I, I, I do think that female surgeons have an advantage of knowing a little bit better what matters to women. And yeah, I, I, I don't then think that's coincidence. Question, but this is, this is very interesting. My last question, uh, the, the study when you're sick, the DIP uh, skin to, you know, to see if there is any uh, fine fiber, the C uh, uh, fibers of the nerves, and you didn't find them. I think it's very important to study to do in the future by taking only biopsies from different sides, uh, sites of the DIP flap and make difference between the site where it's close to the nerve entrance to the flap rather than to the periphery. Because if you took the skin skin pedal and it was way away uh, from uh, the, this uh, entrance point, you will find nothing. You will find never actually any traces of uh, nerve grass re regeneration or any um, uh, fiber in the specimen. Do you agree with that? I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm afraid I didn't understand your question. You, you took one, one case of sensate DIP flap. You resect a piece of the skin, and you study the nerve and the axon, and you couldn't find any. But this piece, it could taken from the periphery of the flap would explain why you don't have any traces of axons and nerve. You should take it close to the zone of nerve coaptation. I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think you're definitely right there. So this was a patient who had a bit of an atypical skin island. Um, normally, or usually, in, in um, we have quite a big skin island and this patient had a very small, narrow piece of skin island that we later resected. And um, I caught it up myself, but it is true that we didn't specifically look at this piece of, yeah, it was, it was in the, it was in the under pole of the breast that we took it from. And that was definitely not close to where we did the coaptation. So that is a really good point. If we had had um, more of a standard, breast reconstruction where the skin island would have been more on the middle of the breast instead of in the lower pole of the breast would have been possible maybe would it, we would have found something because this patient did have the dual um, neurography so we would definitely have expected to see something after 1.3 years but there was nothing at all yeah I'm I agree well thank you very much okay. congratulations really for that The opposition will be continued and finished by Dr. Jong Afat. Uh, Dr. Jong Afat is a plastics and reconstructive surgeon, uh, as well as a clinical epidemiologist at the, uh, at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. Please, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be present here today. Uh, I too would like to start by congratulating you, uh, your team, and of course your inner circle for providing the necessary support throughout the years. Um, actually, our journey starts many years ago in Amsterdam, where I was still a plastic surgery resident and you were a very talented and very, very young medical intern at our department. Um, I remember you put a spell on the entire team with your kind personality uh, by running a tight ship on the clinical wards and by showing a true talent for the clinical side of things. Now, many years later, by delivering this uh, clinically relevant thesis, um, you have shown that you are equally talented as a researcher. So therefore, I am confident that you will be of great value to the field of plastic surgery in the years to come, both as a researcher and as a clinician. But enough with all the kind words, we're going to talk about your thesis because I do have some questions about the content. Um, I too was very much intrigued by um, chapter two. Uh, and since we're doing the defense in English, we'll go to the most international chapter. 
which is chapter 2, um, where you're comparing breast reconstruction choices made in three high-volume breast centers throughout um, Italy, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Uh, the most striking difference to me was that about 50% of patients in the Netherlands, but also in Sweden, undergo autologous breast reconstructions, but over 90% of patients in Italy undergo immediate direct-to-implant reconstructions. Um, I want to start with a question that may be a little bit far off, but I'm going somewhere. What is the average follow-up time of the Italian patients in your study? Um, esteemed opponents, thank you for the very kind words and for the question. So, the follow-up time of the Italian patients, it was not a, a longitudinal study, so we only saw them at the outpatient clinic before the operation and we didn't have any post-operative controls. Um, you, do you mean research follow-up or, or clinical follow-up of these patients? Um, both. Yeah. What is the longest follow-up you've had in these patients, just in general? Yeah, so I was, I was there in, in Rome to do the... To, to, um, give the patient questionnaires to, to the patients themselves and that was always before the operation and, and unfortunately I didn't see them back afterwards. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, because the reason I'm asking is that in some centers where immediate deep clap reconstructions cannot be offered, um, prepectoral tissue expanders are used to spare the nipple and the skin um, while patients are waiting for the secondary deep clap. In Italy, the insertant implants were also placed in the prepectoral space um, so I was wondering, could it be that our Italian colleagues use these implants the same way some centers will, are using tissue expanders, just simply to spare the skin uh, and the nipple while they're waiting to undergo uh, secondary autologous reconstruction somewhere in the future? So in other words, if we wait long enough and we look back at your population, do you think that maybe a large proportion of these patients will have changed their implants for autologous breast reconstructions? Thank you very much for the question because that is a really important question because that would change the entire story if that were the case. Unfortunately not, almost certainly not. And that has to do with the fact that, that in Italy they have a, in my opinion, quite strange reimbursement system um, where somehow the price for a breast reconstruction is included in the price of mastectomy. So somehow they only get a reimbursement for... Um, ah, no, that's not true. It's the other way around here. Completely right, sorry. Um, yeah, so they don't get um, a reimbursement if they would do a, um, um, a primary autologous breast reconstruction and they could have... Um, indeed, they, they would have they would get paid if they would do it in a second setting. So yes, that's definitely possible. Um, but I still don't think that is going to be the case because I saw those patients in Rome. They were extremely tiny and slim. I wouldn't know where I would take the tissue from, to be honest. And also, this was my perception. This was not at all quantitative. I didn't measure this. But these patients seem to be quite happy with the prosthesis. Didn't really ask a lot of questions at the outpatient clinics about safety and about um, worries for complications. Um, so somehow I got the impression that the acceptance of, of um, implant-based re reconstruction was quite high there. So I would be surprised because there's no tissue available in, in very slim and healthy, actually, which is a positive thing, healthy patients. And because I felt like they were actually yeah, quite happy with these reconstructions or okay. the idea of the reconstruction because I didn't see them after the operation to hear what they actually th thought of it. But yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's good to know. What I also found interesting is that the high rate of immediate reconstructions in Italy um, becomes even more interesting to me when I read the explanation of the healthcare system on page 17. Uh, there you state, in Italy, health, care, health insurance covers, uh, covers delayed reconstruction um, and the hospital pays for immediate reconstruction, mm -hmm. which you were also sort of referring to a couple of minutes ago. So if hospitals have to pay for immediate reconstructions, why do 90% of these patients undergo immediate reconstructions over there? Are Italian hospitals incredibly rich? Do they like to spend a lot of money out of pocket? Or do you have a better explanation? 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Of course, I asked this at the department because I wondered the same thing. I couldn't understand it because they told me how the system worked and then I didn't, didn't understand why they would still do all those immediate reconstructions when they would get clearly go bankrupt. But they said it is true, but we, we don't feel good if we... Um, if we um, <laughs> You can briefly finish your answer. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> now I forgot, I forgot what you asked. Um, the high uh, rate of immediate reconstructions and that hospitals have to pay out of pocket. Yeah, for yeah. they said, we are nice, we want the best for our patients, we are paying this with, this with the hospital, but that was very re unique for uh, Policlinico Gemelli. They didn't do that in other Italian hospitals. So that was very unique for this hospital and that's also why the findings are completely not generalizable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young Afat. Um, uh, Ms. Smele, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. Uh, the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and uh, the quality of your defense. And uh, therefore, I request that you and your company await the results of our de deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The, de the PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. Is tied. Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park because we're taking off. Get the mileage, Yeah, 
Ms. Mena? The degree committee uh, here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor van der Hulst is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I okay, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Hansje Puck Smele, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of this, I now present you the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with official seal of the university. Hansje, you are now a doctor. Our heartfelt congratulations. A few years ago, you came from the north to apply for the position of a PhD student in our research line on breast sensibility. During the selection process, it was immediately evident to me that you were determined to achieve your goals, that you believed deeply in the importance of a topic, and that you were willing to relocate to the South. <laughs> <laughs> Your commitment to order and precision was evident too, both in your meticulously, meticulously crafted CV and in your personal demeanor. I knew then that you had to be part of our team. I recall learning shortly afterward from Professor Bing Tan, an ENT colleague, that actually you were the daughter of a highly esteemed ENT uh, surgeon. However, you didn't rely on this connection or seek recommendations. Your talent spoke for itself. And today, you have proven that beyond doubt. Thus began our journey together, a journey marked by countless projects, <laughs> new ideas, nice moments, but also numerous obstacles. At one end, funny things happen, like when any and you found joy in uh, delving into historical textbooks and explored the earliest description of nerve anatomy in the breast. On the other hand, the journey was perhaps less enjoyable when you became the victim of experiments to visualize nerves in the breast using MRI scans. For sure, statistical analysis presented their own challenges, though we were fortunate to have a skilled leader in Sander. Your, achievement, your achievements in overcoming these obstacles fill me with pride. Undoubtedly, one of the greatest challenges we faced was the COVID-19 pandemic. In life, unexpected events happen, and frequently no one is responsible for them. Certainly not you. <laughs> Just accept them and persist moving forward, as at the end you did. 
The pandemic's persistence meant you could pursue international experience as planned. Nonetheless, you made the most of opportunities in Uppsala and Rome. They say there are many paths to Rome, and you choose one of the most enriching ones. Your exploration of Europe didn't end there. Despite numerous failed attempts by others, you successfully contacted a French biologist for a project. Your impeccable French and determination led to a fruitful collaboration with Dr. Fromy, culminating in her visits to Maastricht for a meticulously planned study. Your autonomy and competence throughout this endeavor made me immensely proud. Have you heard of Irene Schouten? Professor van der Hulst suggested the comparison, actually, and I would heartily agree. Like the Olympic champion skater, you share not only an aesthetic resemblance, but also a relentless work ethic. Your determination to achieve your goals mirror hers. And I have no doubt you will continue to excel. As you pursue your future goals, remember that we are always here to support you. Your achievements thus far fill us of pride and we eagerly anticipate witnessing your continued success. Congratulations once again, Doctor. Doctors, Dr. Smele, uh, it is my great honor to uh, congratulate you on behalf of the University of Maastricht, uh, the Board of Deans of the University. Uh, I also would like, of course, to uh, congratulate your supervisors, your supervising team, um, and the family, your parents, your sisters, I understand, uh, and Josh also, is he here? Okay, congratulations also. Um, you did a, a great job. Uh, we were all uh, amazed by your honest and authentic uh, defense. And the only thing I would like to say for myself, I, I got the strong impression that the level of commitment uh, that you have to patient well-being is sensational. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, I would like to switch to Dutch for uh, a brief um, announcement. Um, what we will do, the, the, the uh, supervisory team and uh, the parents and Josh maybe, and, and the paronyms, um, we will make a picture at, uh, in, the, in the hall at the stairs. Uh, and I would like to ask uh, the audience to already go to the rafter for, for the reception. And having said that, I close this ceremony. Recording stopped. <laughs>